um, feedback or noise. Um, when we get to questions, obviously when you're asking a question you can unmute yourself and then mute yourself afterwards. I'll explain how we'll do questions um, later on. Um, we are recording the lecture this evening. Um, if for any particular reason you're uncomfortable about that, you can turn your camera off so that your face doesn't show, uh, or you could even leave and come back at some point and watch the recording rather than, uh, than watching it live. Uh, so that's uh, all entirely up to you. Um, on Zoom, it's entirely up to you how you view the lecture as well. Martin will be sharing uh, some slides from his computer. Uh, you may want to be in speaker view, uh, although you may at other times want to be in the um, gallery view. That's entirely up to you. I think that's all the technical stuff out of the way, so I'm going to hand over to Margaret, who is going to introduce our speaker for the evening. So thank you very much for your patience and apologies for keeping you waiting. Thank you for persevering and persisting. Um, so there's clearly a problem with password stroke invitation and we'll try and work out what it was later so that we don't, um, don't have that frustration again. Um, thank you very much Martin for your patience as well um, and we're really delighted that you've agreed to come and um, give this lecture this evening. Martin is probably fairly well known to many of us in the SCR. He is the Temple Chevalier Chair of Astronomy in the University and he's been in Durham since 2004. He's an observational astrophysicist and he's particularly interested in black holes and quasars and is um, a consultant or was a consultant for the European Space Agency and is involved in the next generation Hubble telescope project. Now I've heard Martin uh, in, within the Williams Library in Chads give a, a wonderful talk um, about astronomy and space and I think we're in for a treat tonight. So Martin, without any further ado, over to you. Um, and we we'll very much look forward to your lecture this evening. Thank you, Margaret. I'm hoping this sharing thing is gonna work. Um, actually, do I need to do it again or do I go straight in, do you think? Uh, you're on mute. You're muted. <laughs> you're muted, actually. You should be able to share it fine now, I think, Martin. Okay, uh, you mean, do it again or um yeah you you'll need to share screen yeah uh, okay. tick the boxes and then share your um powerpoint right i'm hoping that the sound will work it does say sound is on because there are a couple of soundy things right i'm just going to um share the screen and, and bring up the powerpoint great All right, everybody. So thank you for coming. Uh, so I'm going to give a very short um, two minutes about uh, what my title is, the Temple Chevalier Professor, before we go straight into the actual lecture. And I do hope that you will be able to hear the sounds because some of them are quite interesting, I think. Oops. Next slide. Already had a slight technical. OK, there we go. Oh. So this talk is based on one I gave during um, an expedition on a cruise ship last year. It seems like um, eons ago, of course, I'm sure it does to you, July 2019, less than a year ago, when I went to Greenland and gave a series of lectures. That's the ship in the background, and that's me in my, um, my hat and so on. So I won't be doing many of these in the near future again, I suppose, although hopefully in a few years' time we might get back to it. Right, so as I said, just a, a minute, minute and a half on why I'm called the Temple Chevalier Professor of Astronomy. Those of you that know the university and know the Great Hall of the Castle will perhaps recognize this doer looking guy. I think you can see my little arrow with the beard up here. This is Temple Chevalier. He was, um, oh, there are two people entering the waiting room. Okay, don't, I guess they're coming. Don't in. worry, Martin, we'll sort that out. Just comes in, right, fine. Uh, so that's that's he. I have his chair, not the one he's sitting in there, but the chair of astronomy. And Temple Chevalier was the first professor of astronomy in the 1840s, soon after the university started. He was also professor of mathematics and reader in Hebrew. So one out of three is what I have, just the professor of astronomy. Um, the other connection that uh, Chevalier has, of course, is the observatory itself. You can see here the, the building on Potter's Bank and many of you that live in Durham, maybe some who don't, will be familiar with that. Walking out from the town, it's on the right-hand side, Potter's Bank, nice old building, 
the very first building to be commissioned by the new university. As you know, the university was essentially um, gifted, the castle was gifted to the university to begin Durham. Uh, and then the very first thing Durham did as the new university said, what shall we build? And they decided to build the observatory. At the moment, it's not used for anything very much. It's used as a snooker room for um, students at Eustonoff College. But I and some colleagues of mine have plans to use it as an outreach facility in the future. And uh, I hope perhaps some of you might um, be interested in helping us with this because we do need some assistance. It will be in some degree at the Kilda of Durham. If you know the Kilda Observatory way out in the forest, which is a hell of a difficulty to get to, very difficult place to get to. And we have a partnership with Kilda. And the idea is that this observatory, if we can get a bit of funding for it, could be a sort of stepping stone for people that don't want to go to Kilda straight off. Anyway, I digress. Um, so let's get into the actual talk. Just finally mentioning that there's a, um, a crater on the moon called the um, uh, Chevalier uh, Crater. I always have to be careful because it's not Chevalier. Many of you will be familiar with Maurice Chevalier, the famous um, ancient French um, uh, chanteur. Uh, anyway, it's pronounced differently. It's Chevalier as in Cavalier. I think the family were the Huguenots. They came over with the Huguenots and I guess they decided to use um, Chevalier instead of Chevalier to distinguish themselves. So now to the main topic. What is our place in the universe? And related to that, of course, is are we alone in the universe? Because our place in the universe would have a different feel, a different perspective if we were alone. And I think also be very different uh, in terms of our philosophy, our outlook, if we realize we were not alone. So this is what the lecture is about. Uh, no place like home. So the question is, are there other places like home, like the planet Earth? Now, of course, it doesn't have to be a twin of planet Earth, but if we think that um, beings, be they aliens or whatever, or even different life forms, will have to have some of the characteristics of planet Earth, if not all of them, then how many of these places are there throughout the universe? And it may be that uh, these, these people, these aliens or whatever, will, will not be like exactly like us, very unlikely to be exactly like us. But this is just an artist's impression of what it might look like to um, people like us who lived on a planet that was above the the Milky Way looking down above from the Milky Way and having this view of our own galaxy from above. So um, there will be very different perspectives if there are such planets, which I will come to. So the first part of my talk is about our own backyard, our own solar system, and uh, what I call Neighbourhood Watch, which is looking a bit beyond our solar system into the galaxy at large, the nearest stars and beyond. And the third part is boggling the mind, as I call it, and that is how many planets might there be in the whole galaxy and indeed in the whole universe, how many planets that might support life. But supporting life is not the crucial question. The question is, does life exist in these places, regardless of whether it could exist, does it exist? And that's the big question, is there life elsewhere? Um, I hope you're seeing most of this. If you're not seeing the top, it doesn't matter too much. Oh, that's it. Yeah. Uh, so is our solar system unique or is it very common? Well, up until about a few decades ago only, as far as we knew, it was unique. But now, as I'll come to in a few minutes, it seems that it's far from unique. In its particular characteristics, and that is the number of planets and how many of them have rings, etc., it may well be unique, but in terms of there being planets, it is far from unique. So as most of you know, school children can, can uh, rehearse this, there are eight planets. There were nine, but poor old Pluto got demoted to be a minor planet. And that was partly because of its uh, size and the fact there are various criteria that make a planet a planet. And a minor planet is somewhat less than a planet, as the name implies dwarf planets as they're sometimes known. It's to do with its size and also how spherical it is. So it's a somewhat arbitrary definition. But poor old Pluto fell out of the 
typical planets and became a dwarf planet because of its small size and the fact it's not particularly spherical. There are many, many minor planets um, in the asteroid belt, things that are almost planets but not quite big enough. So the definition, as far as we're concerned in our own solar system, is that there are eight of them ranging from Mercury. The Earth is, of course, the third rock from the Sun, uh, and then Mars. This is not to scale this picture, by the way. The distances between the planets are far different from what you're seeing in this um, cartoon, but the sizes are indeed representative. So that's an indication of the relative sizes you can see how small the Earth is, the so-called rocky planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, the rocky planets, compared with the gas giants. And then on the left-hand side is the Sun, which doesn't even fit into this, uh, this picture. Uh, and in a sense, the, the gas giants, if they were a uh, hundred times bigger, they could be a, a small Sun in their own right, but they're not quite big enough to make it. So although they're gaseous, unlike the rocky planets, uh, they don't make it into being um, another sun. But there are many, many systems in the, in the uh, Milky Way, in the universe, that are binary systems with two suns, or even more than two. How did it all begin? Well, it started with a disk of debris left over from the formation of the solar system as material in the interstellar medium began to congregate around uh, a center of mass, which finally became the star. And it's flat because of angular momentum. Angular momentum is spinning, basically. And if something is spinning, it's a bit like the, the famous uh, skater. As they close their arms and bring them in, they spin faster. And so this disk, this debris disk, is an illustration of what happens when angular momentum uh, is operating and you end up with a flattened distribution. This is, by the way, an artist's impression. I should be rather clear about which, which are pictures and which are artist's impression. This is certainly not a picture taken by a satellite. It's an artist's impression. And you can see there's a kind of gap. There's a black region, which is a zone cleared out by a giant planet like Jupiter. And so you probably need these sort of planets to clear out the debris to form solar systems so that Earth can form. There's a lot of simulations in supercomputers going on as to how this actually works. But this is how we think solar systems start, with stuff in the interstellar medium being pulled together towards a central region, which is, becomes the star eventually. Our own backyard, well, you don't get much more backyard than the moon, beautiful picture here of the moon. We hope, by the way, uh, just in passing, that the cathedral, if things go well, may still host the moon, this large um, model of the moon, which we hope will come to Durham if the lockdown permits sometime, I think it's in October, and uh, I hope very much to see it in the cathedral. It's a fantastic thing. If you want to uh, look at this, just type into Google, but not now, uh, the moon and cathedrals, and you'll see other cathedrals that have hosted this exhibition. It's very impressive, and I hope you can visit, and I hope I shall be there as well. So the moon, um, not an ideal place really for life, um, very um, austere, lacking atmosphere, very harsh environment. In fact, this is the classic picture taken from one of the Apollos. I think it was the Apollo that went round the moon but didn't land. So as you know, Apollo 11 was the one that landed. And the famous quote from the astronauts up there uh, was magnificent desolation. And the two things to take away from this picture, I think, is the magnificent desolation of the moon and the beauty of the earth in earth rise. Such a contrast, seeing the oceans, the blue, uh, the atmosphere and the sea and the white clouds, and of course the continents, which tend to be brown in, in color, a huge contrast. So the moon is not a good environment for finding life, no atmosphere, there might be water on the moon in the craters if it's uh, protected from the harsh environment and doesn't evaporate, evaporate. There might be ice, but it's still not going to be a very good habitat. The red planet, Mars. Well, of course, in the olden days, and not that, not that old, just the last century, it was thought by some people 
um, some astronomers and the general public that there might be life on Mars because of these so-called canals. This was a mistranslation of the Italian and it never was thought by the astronomers, at least by the scientists, that there were canals on Mars. But that doesn't stop the general public and the media from getting hold of the wrong end of the stick, as they sometimes do. And that's how this canals on Mars thing got started. Mars is probably a better bet for there being life, or certainly a better bet than the moon, although there are better places than Mars as well. It's about 30 million miles away from the Earth. It varies because of the orbits of the Earth and Mars, both going around the sun in relative positions. On average, 30 million miles, but not always the same, sometimes a bit less, sometimes a bit more. This is one of the pictures taken, this is a real picture, not a simulation of the surface of Mars. And as you probably know, there have been rovers driving around the surface on Mars now for many, many years. What I think is fantastic about this picture is the amount of detail. I mean, this could be Brighton Beach. If you've been to Brighton Beach, it's very rocky. And in fact, just for um, a bit of um, context, I picked up this, this rock from my garden uh, this morning, and it's about the size of this rock here. So this is the detail that you're seeing. It's a absolutely fine detail. So I hope this works. This is the first effort for doing the sound. Maybe uh, one of you could wave or something, or Ashley could wave if you could hear it. I'm about to play you something you may not have heard before. We've seen lots of pictures of other planets, uh, in the solar system at least, and even Mars. But have you ever heard what it's like on Mars? Well, I'm going to play you the sound of a pressure sensor, NASA's pressure sensor on the InSight lander on Mars. You might want to turn the sound up because it's wind. Essentially what you're hearing, I hope, is the sound of wind on another planet. And I think this is really amazing. I'm going to play it twice. I do hope you can hear it. Listen carefully. I think some of you could hear it. I'm going to play it one more time. It doesn't last long. This is the first sounds from another planet. Obviously, when we get astronauts there, then we'll get lots of sounds. But at the moment, this is the first we've ever had. I think it's great to have sounds from other worlds as well. So I hope most of you got that. Okay, maybe we are Martians. What do I mean by that? Well, I'm a bit of a fan of science fiction, although less so than I was as a teenager, but I'm serious. I'm actually serious about this. Maybe we are Martians. How can this be? Well, it's possible that life formed on Mars before it formed on the Earth. Uh, we don't know that for sure, but it may have done, and in which case, if it did, there are volcanoes on Mars, and they explode, they erupt. We have experts on volcano, if Gillian's with us, she's an expert on these sort of things. And maybe in one of these explosions, the debris could have the escape velocity to get away from Mars, to escape from its gravitational field and be captured by the Earth. So if the life was to have started on Mars before the Earth, it might have seeded, uh, it might have seeded from Mars to the Earth. And this is just an example of a meteorite, which we believe is from Mars, it was found in Antarctica, that's another story. But anyway, there are quite a few of these meteorites that we believe are from Mars. There is no direct evidence yet <clears throat> of there being uh, organic material within these meteors. There was a hoo-ha of some decades ago when it was suggest suggested there might have been worms inside these things or fossils of worms, not actual worms, but actually that turned out to be not the case. They were probably just geological features. So we don't know that we are Martians. But just as a bit of an aside, Quatermass and the Pit 
who has seen Quatermass and the Pit, if you've seen it, then you will know that uh, somebody long ago thought we might be Martians, because that was the whole idea of this, um, this sci-fi movie from the 1950s, was that these Martians, they lacked uh, the budgets for good special effects in those days, so they just used these, these rather blow-up pictures of what lo looked like locusts, and these were supposed to be Martians that came to the Earth. So it's not entirely science fiction. We might be Martians. Let's move out then. I need to move on because uh, I realize we started a bit late, but um, I think we'll finish uh, within the next uh, 15, 20 minutes. Next, moving out then to other places in the solar system, moving out to, to uh, Saturn, the ringed planet, we can see here, it has many moons. One of them is Titan. And some years ago now, uh, the Huygens probe, which I want to emphasize, was a European Space Agency mission, not NASA. So Europe does things separate from NASA. Sometimes we do it in collaboration, but we do our own work in Europe. 800 million miles from the Earth, the Huygens probes went to Titan. That's, uh, if you want other units, there's a nice round number, that's a, about a million kilometers. A uh, sorry, a billion, a billion kilometers. That's a long way, 800 million miles, a billion kilometers. Now this is, I don't think I need to tell you, an artist's impression, not a photograph. The Huygens probe parachuted down to the surface of Titan, the moon of Saturn, to quote, down to a sunless sea, because the, the sun is so far away, there's very little light. Most of the light is reflected from Jupiter itself shown here in the artist's impression in the background. But what you're seeing next is a real picture of the surface of Titan a billion kilometers from the Earth, not artwork. So again, to context, this rock that I picked up from my garden here is roughly the size of the rock you can see uh, in that picture, one billion miles away from the Earth. Of course, it's not as fantastic as the Martian picture because it's much more difficult to get to Titan, but it's still pretty impressive what you can get uh, if you have missions to these moons. Maybe a future trip to Europa, that's a moon of Jupiter. Now, these are possible sites of life, which is, of course, the subject of my talk, which is what we're getting to. Now, why could it be that life can form on uh, a moon of Jupiter? or even Saturn. The reason is that some of these moons, we believe from, um, from measurement, from the probes that have been sent there, the space probes, we believe that there are cores, but actually there can be an ice covering, and there can be a liquid ocean underneath the ice covering. So there's water, good old HTO, inside this covering. So we have water, and that's one of the key ingredients for life, the water. And as we know on the Earth, these so-called black smokers deep in the Earth's ocean floor, where again there is no sunlight, the only reason you're seeing this picture, which is a genuine picture of a black smoker in the Earth's uh, uh, ocean floor, is because of uh, artificial light from the submarine probe that is looking at it. Otherwise there'd be no light at all. Now the reason we know that life exists in these black smokers, there is no sunlight, but there is heat. And heat is energy, as, as you know from uh, second year physics or whatever at school. Heat is energy, and so heat is sufficient for life to use for its reproduction purposes. So if on these, um, these uh, moons of Jupiter and Saturn in the water there, there is volcanic activity, there may be black smokers deep in, in these systems, and there could be life. But it would have to be very hardy life. So this is a tardigrade. It's um, a very small um, animal, very cute. It looks very cute, doesn't it? It looks a bit like a sort of hedgehog or something. Sometimes called a moss piglet. It's about half a millimeter across. So if you look on your ruler, and you can see a millimeter, can't you? So you can imagine half a millimeter, you'll just be able to see one of these cute little guys. Why am I mentioning it? It's because they can survive in incredibly harsh places. In fact, they were sent up by the Russians. I guess this can't be considered to be a cruelty to animals because these are really, you know, kind of like bugs in a way. Sent up by the Russians into space and they survived in space, in the vacuum of space and the UV radiation, 
the ultraviolet radiation in space. They were brought back to Earth. They were dehydrated when they were sent up. They were deliberately dehydrated. And when they came back to Earth, they were rehydrated. And I have the number here, 68% of them were reactivated, came back to life. So these things can survive in incredibly harsh environments. So maybe things like this could possibly evolve in the moons of Jupiter, in the environments of the oceans, possibly. I am, of course, jumping the gun completely and jumping over how does life start in the first place. But all I'm saying really is that if life did start, then these little, little guys could exist there. So life is almost everywhere on Earth, deep in the oceans, as I've just shown you, in the frozen wastes of Antarctica, really harsh environments. It emerged on Earth about as soon as it could, just after the surface cooled enough billions of years ago. But we don't know that it's anywhere else. So far, so far we haven't found life anywhere else uh, in the solar system, or indeed anywhere else in the universe. But if life is found on Mars, and we have various probes that have been sent there and are being sent there to look for evidence of life. If it is different from life on Earth, and this is where chirality comes in, and that is the handedness of the life. If it's the same handedness as the Earth, then I'm afraid we haven't really answered the question because who knows whether it formed on Earth first and in the reverse I described for the Martians, maybe it went from the Earth to Mars rather than the other way around. So if it's the same, chirality as the earth then we haven't really answered the question although it's very interesting but if it's not the same so life on earth is left-handed that's the amino acids uh, i can't go into the details here but there is a handedness in other words um is it right-handed or left-handed like the double helix uh, if it's different on mars then that tells us something amazing that tells us that life has formed independently from the earth and indeed, if we found it on one of the uh, moons of Jupiter or Saturn, same applies. So that's something to look, at, look out for. So our home planet moving out into the uh, beyond the solar system, how many Earths are there? Earth is just a play, pale blue dot as seen from 4 billion miles away by the Voyager satellite. Now, the more astute of you will have noticed that this is a square box and the Earth is not a square. Some of you may be old enough to remember Michael Bentin's It's a Square World, but you have to be pretty old to remember that. Uh, but anyway, the Earth is not a box, but when you have pixels on a camera, that means you're hitting the resolution limit. So it means that the image of the Earth, which of course is a nice sphere, is embedded within one pixel of the camera. This is what it looks like from four billion miles away. And if you want a poetic version of this, which I couldn't possibly um, try to reproduce, please go onto YouTube and look for Carl Sagan, a pale blue dot, and you'll get his, um, his speech, his soliloquy about how everything that ever lived, that ever existed and ever, uh, all religions, all things on earth are within this little dot. So that's something to, uh, to look at. The nearest star is 25,000 billion miles away. So do the ratio, we wouldn't even see this dot even with our most powerful telescopes. And that's the nearest star. So the Neighbourhood Watch now is looking for extrasolar planets beyond the ones in our solar system. There are several techniques in use. One is by the shadows of a star, of a planet seen against its star, and the other one is the wobble in the path of the star. As of June the 1st, 2020, I like to be up to date. Uh, well, almost up to date, not far off. There were 4,268 confirmed extrasolar planets. And that means they really are, they're not just hints, they are really extrasolar planets. But very few uh, would be nice places to live. How do we know about these? Well, we know about them through satellites in the case of the shadows. So what we're looking at is we're looking at the part, and this again is not a real image, it's an artist's impression. The planet is moving across its host star and is causing a mini eclipse. Of course, when you think of an eclipse, you think of the whole sun being blocked out. But you can have a partial eclipse where only a little bit of the host star is blocked out. And in the lower plot, you see a trace of the intensity of light as this little 
image of the of the planet which is dark goes across the star which is the bright orangey thing and this is what we see how we can detect it we see the dip in the light as it goes across and then comes out again and that's how we detect most of the extrasolar planets the other way of doing it is by the wobble and let me explain this by showing you this this is a wobble method this is where the star and the planet are dancing around each other a bit like a seesaw imagine if this was a seesaw a very fat person if you wanted to balance the seesaw would sit near the fulcrum and a very light child would sit far away to get the thing balanced and that's called the center of mass so the x here would be the fulcrum of the seesaw and the big thing is the star and the little thing is the planet we can't see the planet because it's too small it's too faint but we can see that the big star is wobbling in terms of its velocity relative to us and that wobble we can measure in terms of its uh, recession velocity with our spectrographs and that's how we measure of order a few hundred of these extrasolar planets now this is one of these uh, another one of these audios the kepler satellite which is a nasa satellite has found thousands of these uh, extrasolar planets beyond our solar system and what they've done is they've made this artist's impression and what you're going to see and it's very beautiful i think so i'm going to let it run for about two minutes there's a nice soundtrack which is the um uh um i'm forgetting which classical music it is it's the uh, nocturne i believe it's the nocturne um and what we're going to see is the two things going around each other in correspondence to their orbital speeds in other words their periods so if you imagine planets going around their stars with different velocities at different speeds in a sense they're dancing around their planets and this is what you're seeing here you're seeing a mosaic of these things with the sign track the uh, the actual images shown there were made up they were simulations but the speed at which they went round each other the different speeds are genuine speeds as measured so habitable worlds and as i call it the goldilocks principle not all of these planets are habitable what we think is that for there to be life as we know it or anything like as we know it we need to have liquid water and that means certain distance from the host star otherwise uh, you either have ice or you have steam and that's not good for life so the goldilocks principle is that it mustn't be too hot it mustn't be too cold it's got to be just right and planets can be just right moons could be just right if you have the liquid water uh, under the ice surface and these so-called nomads these are floating planets that have become detached from their stars they're probably not all right because they don't have the right environment for life so this is a, a bit of a joke really it's from nasa um, book now for your favorite planet we know what the conditions are like on some of these planets that have been discovered the extracellular ones they have very boring names i'm afraid this one called kepler 16b it has two stars so as it says down here if you visit this planet your shadow always has company and the other one is a nomad uh, in other words it doesn't have its own star 
that's this boring name PSO with a number and there the, the strap line is visit this planet where the nightlife never ends Martin, you seem to have frozen. I don't know whether you can hear me. I think you're frozen again. Martin, I don't know if you can hear us, but you've you've frozen, so I've, I'm not quite sure what the solution is to that. Could you send Martin an email, Margaret? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It might be that while while he's frozen, if people are, I'm sure you are thinking of your questions, and maybe in the chat on the right, you could just alert Ashley to whether or not you'd like to ask a question when. Uh, when Martin is on, on frozen. You don't need to write your question in the chat, but if you've got one that you'd like to ask, um, if you just identify yourselves and then um, Ashley can um, pick you up. Let me just try and email Martin and see. Might not seem of any And uh, Ashley may end up having to, to answer the questions if, uh, if we can't unfreeze Martin. Our questions. Um, right, I, Martin's not unfreezing. I don't know, can we switch him off and on again, Ashley? Is there anything we can do like that? Or, or anyone who's more experienced in Zoom than we are, do you have suggestions about uh, how you can unfreeze somebody? I think it's best he leaves and rejoins. Okay. If you remove him and as host, you can remove him and then he could rejoin. Right. Okay. So can you remove him, Ashley? Yeah, uh, it appears he's already I think he's gone. Oh, right. Okay. So maybe he's going to try and come back. Let's hope he does. I think he's probably doing that himself. Yeah, there's a few of you suggesting on and off again. It's obviously got too close to a frozen planet. <laughs> yeah. No sign of him, he's not back yet. Yeah. Hi there, I'm back. Sorry. Oh, great. Excellent. Excellent. Do you, do you know, I don't know what happened. Was it no. because it was an hour? Was it because the hour was up? Something? That, that doesn't usually happen, so I don't know. But anyway, it's good to have you back. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll wrap up fairly quickly so people can keep on uh, for a moment. Yeah, I don't know what happened. It just went away. Um, yeah. Like yeah, you just froze. You were at the, um, the NASA tourist posters for other planets. Yep, yep. Uh, I need to share everything again, do I? You will, yes, please, Martin. Yeah. Um, oh, there seem to be several things coming up at once here. Okay, I think I'm in business, yep. We don't have any more uh, sounds, do we? I think, okay. Yep, that's working. Okay.
Right. So, yeah, we're, we're, there we are. Was it? No, it was the two travel the posters video. where the nightlife never stops. Oh, okay. That's where it was. That's right. it. Okay. Well, then, uh, wrapping up, then, um, are we still there? Yes, you're still yeah. with us. Yeah. Okay. How many average planets are in the entire universe? Um, billions, 10 billion, billion terrestrial planets in the whole universe. Not all of them are habitable, of course. Maybe a billion uh, in, in our own Milky Way, so that's still a lot. Uh, the best place to be is in this zone in between the outer parts and the middle part, because the central part is, uh, is too dangerous because of supernovae, which would destroy life, and outer parts uh, don't have the right chemical composition. Uh, so, are we alone? The, the final part is, there were suggestions, of course, that life might exist on other planets. Uh, way back, uh, Bruno suggested this. He uh, came to a sticky end. Actually, it wasn't just because of this suggestion. I think it was because he'd, um, he'd uh, fell foul of the church in various other ways, and this might have been the final straw. But anyway, claiming the existence of other worlds meant that, uh, that he was not in favour with the church. So the search for intelligent life in the universe, we are listening for signals from other planets from way beyond our solar system. And we are also sending, we sent a message from the earth. It doesn't look very impressive here, but the idea was to send images of ourselves, um, something that shows that we understand physics and maths and pictures of a radio telescope. So we've been sending these messages out. And indeed our TV transitions have been sent out as well. Uh, and these have now reached about the 30 nearby stars. This is because whether we like it or not, these transmissions are being beamed out from our TV transmitters. And because light travels at a certain speed, they've now reached the 30 nearby stars. And so these distant stars could be watching I Love Lucy uh, from the American TV or from our various versions of things in our own uh, broadcast systems here. So if there were aliens, they could be watching this and goodness knows what they would make of it. So will the aliens be friendly? Um, of course, most of the sci-fi uh, assumes they will not be friendly. War of the Worlds and many, many other sci-fi movies. There's a big question and that is, if life is spread throughout the universe, then why haven't they dropped in to see us by now? It seems surprising if life's everywhere. Well, of course, large numbers of uh, Americans living in the Midwest do think that uh, they have been visited by aliens already. Uh, and some of them believe, of course, that they have been abducted by aliens already. But the evidence for this is, um, is not terribly convincing to most people, to most scientists. So there is no strong evidence that aliens have visited the Earth. And this is hardly surprising given the distances. So very finally then, the voyage to the stars. What about us going to the stars? Well, we can imagine going to Mars, perhaps, but going to the stars is a different matter. It's possible that there may be another space race between the United States going back to the moon and possibly China going to Mars. This is all, of course, local within our solar system. But what we don't have is, and this is the last audio if it works, is the iconic speech from President but Kennedy. Why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why 35 years ago fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Did you hear that, Ashley? Could you get the audio? Yeah. Good. Because I think that's, I really like the last bit. We, we do these things, but not because they're easy, but because they are hard. I just love that phrase. And I think the, uh, the quality of American presidents has gone downhill somewhat since, uh, since this point. <laughs> so now, um, then, the billionaire space race. This is uh, Musk and, uh, and the Amazon guy, um, Be Bezos, yeah. And so, as you know, Musk has sent up the Dragon to the space station recently. So it may be that the space race involves these people. And our children, our grandchildren could be the first space tourists. 
although this may be a while even beyond the cruise ships getting going again but in in our lifetime in the next 10 20 years there will be space tourists and finally then just another billionaire uh, yuri milner um, is shown here on the left hand side together with uh, you know who with stephen hawking and various other people has put a lot of money into sending a probe to the nearest star hasn't done it yet but this is the plan it's a tiny tiny thing the size of a mobile phone chip but it gets there in 30 years because it goes 20 percent the speed of light now why is this interesting it means that it can get to the nearest star take a picture of the planet around that star on this tiny chip there can be a camera on it amazingly and send the picture back and that would be the best picture we're ever going to get of a nearby star's planet and may give us evidence for life so finally a provocative thought and um, i have specially here because it's so provocative i've got my um, my mail hat this is a revolutionary thing that i'm going to say here so panspermia is the hypothesis that seeds of life spread throughout the universe well if that's the case then there's life everywhere but what if we are really alone we are really alone in an extravagant empty of life universe then maybe we should spread our dna seed this is now possible with genetic engineering and using the breakthrough technology that was the yuri milner thing we could send our own dna to the nearest stars with their planets if we wanted to now i call this um donum vitae which i'm sure the latin scholars here will know that that means the gift of life so should we do this? Should we seed the universe with our DNA? Discuss. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Martin. Thank you. Um, I, I suspect jazz hands is the way to uh, acknowledge Martin's um, uh, talk tonight. So I'll stop the share now so I can see people. That would be great, thank you. And um, I'm sure Martin will be very happy to answer questions. So if you would like to ask a question, please um, say so in sip of my uh, of wine, I, either know. say so in chat or I've seen one or two hands popping up and I'll try and uh, I'll try and get to everybody. Um, Antonia, you I see you'd like to ask a question. If you want to unmute yourself and uh, and do that, that would be great. Or were you just applauding the um, the talk? Just clapping. Okay. If you would like to ask a question, then please put your name in. Uh, just need to put your name in the chat. So this one is from Georgiana. Do you want to unmute yourself and ask the question so that everyone can hear? Hello. Hi there. Yeah, can okay, you? Great. Thank you for the talk, Martin. It was really good. You were one of our first year lecturers, actually. And so we, me, Nicola and Sean have come back just to see you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about the hiccup in the middle. I've no idea what happened. Blame it on Bill Gates. <laughs> okay, so my question slash questions are, how long, in your opinion, till we find more life? And you mentioned that astronauts may visit Mars, and you seem very confident that they will visit Mars. But do you think humans will ever visit another galaxy, perhaps, in the future, um via a wormhole or other means so what's your opinion on those please okay several questions there so i might ask my uh, my friend here to, uh, <laughs> to help me. um so the first bit was um going to going to mars i think the most likely scenario there is probably not a space agency more likely or at least not nasa or not ESA. more likely to be um musk of course he has plans to send people to mars i think hugely ambitious plans but nevertheless I mean he's making progress he's got the um, the dragon working to the space station my guess is not uh, not in the next decade perhaps in the next 20 years assuming the world economies don't collapse and so on there is another possibility and that is China may decide to do it and that is a national space agency so in a way they're kind of where the US was during the moon race they're doing it for national prestige and they don't have to worry about uh, about money because they've got loads of money and so if they want to do it the chinese could be there i think in 10 15 years and sometimes i i make a bit of a joke i used to go to china quite a bit and i sometimes say i may have passed the first human to uh, to walk on mars when i drove past a kindergarten in shanghai 
because that would be the age of the, uh, the astronauts going there. Now, uh, I may have missed one of your points, so remind me if I've missed one, but going to another galaxy, unless you believe in um, Star Trek transporters and things, I, it can't happen because the distances are just too enormous. Going to the nearest star, if you think of suspended animation, um, yes, maybe. But then what I said at the very end, this provocative thing about sending our DNA, would that count as us going there? Or do you have to have somebody with a brain that can remember that they went there? I mean, is our life enough or does it have to be an astronaut? If so, it's got to be suspended animation to get there which um, I'm not sure people would be bothered to put the uh, expense and the effort in. And it would take, by conventional means, it would take uh, thousands of years to get there. So the people that sent it would have many generations gone away. Was there a third, a third bit to it? I think there was a third. There was Mars. It was, I was just asking, um, it was how long till we find more life, do you think in your opinion? Oh yes, how, yes. Do you think it would be something that, that would happen soon? Yeah. Or do that, you think that, it will be something in the future? No, a very good, very good point. Crucial point, really. Well, this is, again, very difficult to say. Uh, there was a thing called the Drake Equation, which is a long algebraic formula, which is what are the chances of there being life in the universe? You need to have habitable zone. But the big unknown, we can actually answer some of those questions. We know how many planets have habitable zones. But the big question is, how does life start? And that we just don't know. So that's the answer. If you, if you count zero as uh, it's only happened once and here we are, and one is it's everywhere, it's somewhere between zero and one. And unfortunately, we can't say much more than that. So the chances of picking it up, I mean, we are trying, but the problem is this listening thing with our radio telescopes, that assumes that they're actually broadcasting towards us because uh, probably the high technology aliens wouldn't be using wasteful broadcasting where you just broadcast to the whole universe. They'd be using lasers, directional things. So they would have to be deciding to broadcast to us. So I really can't say. It would be great, wouldn't it? I mean, it would be nice. I think it would make a difference to uh, many aspects. Maybe religion. Uh, that's a whole different topic there. But uh, David Wilkinson doesn't mind if there's lots of aliens. They probably aren't going to be Protestants or Church of England, but you know he doesn't mind if they're aliens. And I think most um, theologians that I've come across think it would be okay if there was life on other planets. But it does raise interesting questions. <laughs> okay, thank you, Martin. I think Sean has a question. Hi, can you hear me? Mm. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. Uh, yeah, thank you for um, the talk. Um, my question was, so you said um, that chirality um, of like amino acids and like chemical mm. compounds are one way to determine whether life uh, developed independently. Um, say that, that life was found and it had the same chirality. Are there any other ways to determine whether it was independently formed? A good question. I'm perhaps not expert enough. Well, I know I'm not expert enough in biology to know. I think the crucial thing is is the chirality because obviously evolution can take all sorts of different paths. There are dead ends to evolution. It can go in all sorts of directions. So the fact that life that we might find either in the solar system or detection beyond is totally different uh, doesn't mean that it didn't come from the same source. And if you believe in panspermia, by the way, panspermia is where um, not necessarily just from Mars, it might even be on, um, it could be on comets and it could go to other solar systems. So it could have originated on one solar system, within one solar system, and then be carried by comets or debris, bits and pieces going from other solar systems. So it could be spreading that way and it might still be a single spark. So it wouldn't be easy to tell whether it had a single origin or not. I believe the chirality would be a crucial thing because you've got to have an independent origin if the chirality, unless there's a, bi if there's a biologist listening in that wants to contradict or jump in, please do, because I'd be very interested to hear. But I think chirality is, is a crucial one. Okay, thank you, Martin. I think we have another question from Elizabeth. 
from my husband. Oh, okay. <laughs> from Joe. Uh, I believe you said that, uh, well, thank you first for a wonderful talk. The, um, I believe you referred to a chip being sent to a star that ha has to be accelerated to 20% of the speed of light. However is that achieved? Good point. So I have here a mobile phone and within here there is a, a tiny chip which does the camera and that's the sort of thing they're going to send. How do you do it? You do it with lasers and so you have um, a solar sail. So the chip itself is tiny tiny but there is a solar sail of many square meters. I forget the exact number. Large numbers of square meters of solar sail and the lasers from the earth, and this is where it gets a bit tricky and the technology is not quite there yet. But if you had enough lasers, probably enough to uh, fill half the size of Wales, um, then, and you fire them all at this solar sail at the same time, it gives an impulse, a push. And that push is enough momentum to send it off to this other star at 20% the speed of light. Now there's a bit of a downside and that is, it's going 20% the speed of light, so it goes past pretty fast when it gets there. So you have to be um, pretty swift in getting your picture. So the idea is you don't send one, you send thousands of these things. They're only tiny. You send thousands and thousands of them, and you hope that one of them at least gets a good snapshot. So you have to have a lucky snapshot. There's another downside, actually, which I, I chatted to the people who are doing this because I'm, I'm invited to their um, discussions occasionally. And that is if by some bad chance, very unlikely chance, one of these probes hits the star, the planet rather, that it's supposed to be taking the photograph of, because it's going 20% the speed of light, it's only tiny, but it has the energy, that's a half mv squared kinetic energy, of a tactical nuclear weapon. So if it did happen to hit the planet by, by bad luck, then these aliens might think that we've declared war on them and they come and eat us. <laughs> Fascinating, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much, Martin. Are there any more questions? Does anybody else want to ask? I think, uh, uh, I mean, time is getting on, but I suspect there's time for one or two more questions if anybody would like to ask. I'm fine. Okay, uh, I think somebody in Jeremy Dibble's box is waving at me. Would you like to ask a question? We can't hear you. I don't know whether you're muted. Oh. Is it, is it on mute? It doesn't seem to be on mute, but we can't hear, hear you. No, I think we heard you there. Try now. Try talking. Ah, oh, it's not working. No. If you would like to type your question in the chat, I can read it out for everyone. By all means, yes. I've come across this problem before. It's to do with the microphone that's selected, and it's a bit fiddly, so... Yeah, type in your question if you can in chat. Whilst we're waiting, does anybody else have a question? No? Okay, we'll just wait for this last one, hopefully, to come through. Martin, I'll ask a question just while we're waiting. Um, so you, you asked the provocative question at the end about the DNA, mm. um, sending that hither and thither. I mean, that, that's presumably pretty much impossible or very, very abstract, but, but even if you could, um, and even if anything could evolve into anything that looked vaguely like humans, that wouldn't, couldn't operate alone. You'd have to send the DNA of all kinds of other sustaining life to, to make that possible. Well, that's a good question. I mean, what is the spark of life? I mean, does it need more than just, you, you, you genetically engineer, engineer the DNA to be suitable for the planet that you sent it to. So you'd know something about the conditions of the planet. That you sent it to. So I don't know whether it would need anything else. It needs to reproduce. But once it reproduces, would that maybe be enough? So I think the big question is, should we do it? And I didn't mention this, but we were going to have a conference here at, um, at St. John's College. I was hoping David Wilkinson uh, might be available, but we were hoping to, do, to have a, a meeting about whether we should do it, the ethics of whether we should do it. Because obviously if life already existed and we sent our DNA, and it wiped out the life that was already there, that would be bad. So we would probably want to incorporate some sort of um, mitigation within the DNA if there was life already was there. But no, I mean, it is science fiction, but if we can send one of these probes, like I mentioned, to take the photograph, 
then we can send one with DNA on it. So it's not that crazy. Um, I think the big question is, would we, should we do it? And I mean, if you, you decide whether it's worth it or not, I mean, the universe is a big place, but do, is it like colonization? Is it a new, a new version of colonization, sending our DNA throughout the universe? Okay, we have the question from um, Jeremy um, about Enceladius. If we send a probe there and it successfully penetrates the ice into the ocean, mm. is there a moral problem about contamination of life there? Ah, uh, yes, very, very good question. Thank you very much for that. Um, we now believe that we now are very careful, we, I mean the space agencies, are very careful to sterilize everything thoroughly. However, we weren't in the past. In the past, we were hopelessly not careful. And so the early probes that were sent to the moon, which doesn't matter too much, I guess, um, and the ones that were sent even to Mars were not fully sterilized. So there is a concern that we may have inadvertently, if one of these um, people in the, the suits, you know, that do the screwdrivers and, and um, uh, screw down the satellite bits and pieces, if they sneezed into the wrong place, then uh, the viruses and the bacteria, of course, viruses aren't really alive, but maybe other things, bacteria, could have contaminated the probes. And so we may already have contaminated Mars in the early probes, we weren't so careful. So I think all we can do is be as careful as possible, but you're right. I mean, nothing's 100%, so there is a possibility of contamination. Mind you, you'd have to wait a few million years, I guess, for it to evolve into something interesting. So it's not likely that we would see the, uh, the problem that we've created. So if we were looking for life there, uh, if, if your question was, would we detect our own life that we contaminated? I think the answer is no, because we'd certainly be careful enough not to contaminate it as badly as that. But if it was just a trace that then evolved over millions of years, then yes, that could happen, but not for the things that we're looking for with our probes. Good question, very good question. Martin, thank you very much indeed. And thank you to everybody who's asked questions. Uh, Martin, that was a fascinating um, presentation. Uh, the numbers and distances and speeds are completely mind-boggling, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you made the whole thing very accessible. And, Thanks for sticking uh, with it. See, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, statistically, it seems unlikely that we're alone in the universe, but you never know. Anyway, thank you very much indeed for your lecture. Um, I'm sure we've all learned a great deal from it. So if people want to um, jazz hands or yellow hands or whatever, and uh, thank Martin. That would be wonderful, Martin. Thank goodbye you very much. Goodbye from me indeed. and goodbye from him. <laughs> yeah, it's not quite yet. I think uh, Dr. Martin wants another word. Yeah, just to add my thanks. That was a fascinating lecture. And, and uh, thank you for everyone for sticking with us as we kind of uh, get to grips with this um, technology. Um, in the course of, of these uh, lectures, we're trying to give you different things each week. Um, so next week, it's art history. And it's Lucy Whelan, who's an expert on the post-impressionist artist Pierre Bonnard. And her title is uh, Seeing, Hiding and Finding Women in Modern Art, The Case of Marthe Bonnard. So again, I'm sure there'll be beautiful pictures um, in that uh, presentation. Same time, same place, six o'clock. Um, and we'll try and make sure that we send you um, the accurate Zoom invitation. But thank you very much, everything, everyone, for coming. And thank you especially, Martin, for a great lecture. Thank Bye, you. everyone. Great.